Namaste and welcome to Daily News Simplify, the what, why and how of newspaper reading. Now we would be analyzing the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper of 4th of January 2019 and the news that would be covered today is given on the screen and the timestamp for the same is given in the description and the comment section given below. And so now with this, let us start with the first article. Now we have taken the lead editorial from the editorial page on page 8. Now what this article highlights are 5 issues that are required to be undertaken comprehensively. Within this year of 2019, Swiss India is able to achieve a sustained high growth rate. Now you have to understand that this editorial written by C. Rangarajan sir is extremely relevant with regards to your UPSC civil services examination. And based on that, we would also recommend that you also read this editorial. Now before moving forward in the analysis of this editorial, there are few points with regards to the analysis that should be made clear. The first aspect is that we are going to look at every concern in an individual manner. And the second point is that you should see this article from the perspective of GS Paper 3 within the section Economic Development and within the subsection Indian Economy and issues relating to Indian Economy such as of growth, development and of employment. And so now with this, let us understand the first concern that has been raised by the author with regards to investment ratio. Now before understanding the concern with regards to investment ratio, what you need to first understand is that the growth rate of a country depends on two aspects, first being investment rate and second being the productivity of its capital. Now to understand this further, what you need to first understand is what is capital output ratio. Then we'll understand as to what is incremental capital output ratio. Then understand what is inverse incremental capital output ratio. And after that, it will give you an understanding as to what the author means by productivity of capital or its inverse incremental capital output ratio. Now what is meant by capital output ratio is that it is the amount of capital needed to produce one unit of output. So let's say you have a capital of rupees 50 which you can invest. And by investing this rupees 50, you are able to produce an output of rupees 5. Whereby the one unit that has been produced by investing rupees 50 is worth rupees 5. And therefore your capital output ratio would be of rupees 10. Whereby 10 rupees as investment is required to produce one unit of output. Now you have to understand that this capital investment includes both temporary investment and permanent investment. Wherein let's say if you have spent rupees 30 to purchase an equipment, then this equipment would be available to you for the next 10 to 15 years. While the amount of money that you spend on electricity, the workers payment and other aspects would be a form of temporary investment. So therefore permanent capital investment such as in machinery is able to give you an output for a longer period of time. While temporary capital investment such as in electricity, workers payment and other aspects are able to give you an output for a shorter period of time. And so therefore capital output ratio varies from industry to industry, country to country. And therefore as the author has highlighted, capital output ratio is a catch-all expression and depends upon multiple number of factors such as quality of labor and other aspects. Now the reason the capital output ratio is important with regards to measurement of an economy because it helps economic planners in understanding the required investment for achieving a particular amount of economic growth. So now let's say for an example, a country has a GDP of rupees 100 and the amount of money that this country invests is rupees 30. And let's say this country also has a growth rate of 6%, then the capital output ratio for this country would be rupees 5. Whereby what this means is that rupees 5 would be required as amount of capital to produce one unit of output in this country. And so therefore, let's say if India has a capital output ratio of rupees 5, while China has a capital output ratio of rupees 4, then it means that more amount of capital is required to produce one unit of output in India as compared to China. And so therefore, the first significant aspect of capital output ratio is that a lower capital output ratio means that there is more productivity of capital. So let's say if the capital output ratio for India is rupees 5 and the capital output ratio for China is rupees 4, now it means that one unit of output is being produced at rupees 5 in India but is being produced at a lower cost of rupees 4 in China. And therefore what this means is that low capital output ratio means higher productivity in an economy. Whereby this brings us to the second aspect is how it is significant for understanding the investment required for growth. So let's say from this example itself. Then for this same country to have an economic growth rate of 10% 
it either has to make sure that its capital output ratio is reduced to rupees 3 or that its investment is increased to rupees 50. And it is through either of these aspects or a combination of both these aspects that this country can achieve an economic growth rate of 10%. And this is how capital output ratio is significant for understanding the investment required for a particular amount of economic growth. And it is based on this that we come to the second aspect as to what is incremental capital output ratio and what is inverse incremental capital output ratio. Now incremental capital output ratio means the additional capital or investment that is required to produce an additional unit of output. Now again going back to the first example, rupees 10 is required to produce one unit of output. And so therefore the additional capital that would be required to produce two units is known as the incremental capital output ratio. And therefore to produce the second unit, rupees 10 is again required. And therefore the total cost of producing two units becomes rupees 20. And therefore the capital output ratio is rupees 10. But if let's say to produce the second unit, only rupees 4 is being spent. Whereas we have already understand that there is a difference between permanent investment and temporary investment. Whereby to produce the first unit, the permanent investment has already been taken care of. And therefore the amount that is required to produce the second unit only includes the temporary investment. And the only amount that you would be spending to produce the second unit would be on electricity, the workers pay and other aspects of temporary investment. And therefore what this does is that only rupees 14 is being spent to produce two units. And thereby this reduces the capital output ratio to rupees 8. But what is a negative scenario is that to produce the second unit, rupees 16 is being spent. Whereby what this means is that the investment that is required to produce the second unit has actually gone up. And what this has done is increase the capital output ratio to rupees 12. And as we have already understood, low capital output ratio means higher productivity. But if the amount of money which is being spent on producing the second unit is more than the first unit, it means that there has been a decrease or a decline in productivity. And it is within that context that the author is saying that inverse incremental capital output ratio is required. Whereby a continued decrease in the capital output ratio means that India is having higher productivity. Therefore what the author is recommending, whereby the amount of capital or investment that has been put in should lead to continuous higher returns. And this can be done by having a low incremental capital output ratio wherein the additional capital or the investment required to produce additional unit of output continues to decrease over time. So let's say to produce the first unit rupees 10 has been spent, to produce the second unit rupees 4 has been spent. Then let's say to produce this third, fourth and fifth unit again rupees 4 is being spent. And therefore to produce the sixth unit the amount of money required should come down to rupees 3 and thereby would lead to a decrease in the incremental capital output ratio. And so therefore up till here you've understood as to what is capital output ratio, what is incremental capital output ratio and what the author means by inverse incremental capital output ratio. Now you need to understand all of these three basic theoretical concepts of economy especially with regards to your prelims examination. Now the concern that has been raised by the author is that the gross fixed capital formation ratio in India has fallen from 35% in 2007 and 8 to 28% in 2017-18. Now what you need to understand first is what is gross fixed capital formation ratio. Now in simplest of terms gross fixed capital formation ratio is the percentage of investment made each year from the total GDP. So let's say a GDP of a country is rupees 500 and the investment that this country makes as percentage of GDP is rupees 200 then the gross fixed capital formation ratio would be 40. And it is within that context that the author is saying that the gross fixed capital formation ratio for India has fallen from 35% to roughly 27% in the year 2017-18. And therefore the percentage of investment that is being made each year as percentage of total GDP of India is continuously declining. And therefore it is within that regard that the author has given a solution. Now the first solution that the author has given is that the incremental capital output ratio for India should be kept at 4. Now to understand this, you need to understand what is the link between incremental capital output ratio and gross fixed capital formation ratio. 
whereby gross fixed capital formation ratio measures the amount of investment, while what incremental capital output ratio does is measure the efficiency of that investment. And therefore what the author is recommending is that even though the gross fixed capital formation ratio has decreased in India, what is required to be done is improve the efficiency of investment even though it may be a lesser amount. Now what this means is that if the amount of investment has decreased in India, then what should be done is to improve the efficiency of those investment so that the additional capital or investment which is required to produce additional unit of output has also decreased. Whereby we have already understood that the incremental capital output ratio should always be a smaller number and it is within that context that the author is saying that the incremental capital output ratio should be below 4 for India. Whereby as you have already understand that if the incremental capital output ratio is high then it means that the productivity in the economy is low. And therefore it is within that context that the author has recommended inverse incremental capital output ratio that there should be a continued decline in the additional capital or the investment that is required to produce an additional unit of output. The second solution given by the author is to increase the investment in the Indian economy. And the third and the final solution given by the author is to improve the political and the economic environment. However, the author has not given any form of solution as to how this political and economic environment can be improved or what measures can be undertaken so as to increase investment within the Indian economy. But hopefully with regards to this, you have understood the concern and the solution highlighted by the author with regards to investment ratio. And with regards to your civil service examination, especially with regards to your upcoming prelims examination of 2019, keep in mind as to what is capital output ratio, what is incremental capital output ratio, and what is gross fixed capital formation ratio, and what is the link between all three of them. Now a question for your practice is despite being a high saving economy, capital formation may not result in significant increase in output due to, and this question was asked in the prelims of 2018. Now what you can do is pause this video, solve this question and wait for 5 seconds for the correct answer. Now the correct answer to this question is D, high capital output ratio. Now as you already understand that even though if you have an investment of rupees 30 and you increase this investment to rupees 50, if you continue to have high capital output ratio, it would not result in a significant increase in output. Whereby high capital output ratio means that there is low efficiency of investment or low efficiency of productivity within that economy. And it is within that context that the author has said that the investment capital output ratio should be kept low for India. So that even though investment has fallen within the country, it could still lead to higher economic growth if the efficiency of those investment is kept high. And this can be done by keeping a low capital output ratio. So now hopefully you've understood the concerns and the solution raised by the author with regards to investment ratio. And so now let us move on to the second aspect of banking system. Now the second concern which has been raised by the author is with regards to the banking system of India. Whereby the banking system is an important factor which affects the economic growth of India. Now the first concern which has been raised by the author with regards to the banking system is of the non-performing assets. When as you already understand that the non-performing asset form as high as 16% as a proportion of loans of public sector banks. The second concern raised by the author is that 11 public sector banks continue under the prompt corrective action. Whereby the prompt corrective action is a supervisory tool which is being used by the Reserve Bank of India so as to improve the financial health of these 11 public sector banks. The fourth concern raised by the author is of the stress in the NBFC sector. Now what has happened is that it was the banks that used to lend money to the non-banking finance companies. However, what has happened is that after the ILFS crisis, the banks have reduced the amount of money that it is lending to non-banking finance companies. And therefore what this has done is create a stress within the NBFC sector. And the fourth main concern which has been raised by the author is of the decline in credit from banks and non-banking finance companies. Now as you already understand that the public sector banks currently have huge number of non-performing assets. And because of these non-performing assets, banks have to keep a large amount of their money as provisioning requirement. And because of this increase in the provisioning requirement, 
it declines the ability of banks to lend credit. Now what happens is that when a bank declares a particular loan as a non-performing asset, it then has to keep a certain amount of money out of its own profit as part of the provisioning requirement of the Reserve Bank of India. And this money that the bank has kept aside as provisioning requirement, then the bank cannot use this money to lend to companies, entities or for any other purpose. Till that time, the non-performing assets of the bank reduces. And as you already understand that 16% of the loans of the public sector banks are currently non-performing assets, the public sector banks have a huge provisioning requirement. And this has reduced the ability of these public sector banks to lend money to the private or the NBFC sector. And apart from this, the non-banking finance company usually borrow money from the banks. However, because of the ILFS crisis and also because the banks themselves are under stress, it has reduced the ability of non-banking finance companies to also lend credit. And the reason the banks used to lend money to non-banking finance companies is because, let's say, if a bank has loaned some particular amount of money, then it is the risk of the bank if the loan becomes a non-performing asset. However, if the bank has loaned money to a non-banking finance company, then what this non-banking finance company would do is charge more interest and lend this money to the private sector. And so if this private company or this private individual does not pay back the amount to the non-banking finance company, it becomes a non-performing asset for the NBFC, but it does not become a non-performing asset for the banks themselves. And therefore what this does is it reduces the risk of the bank, whereby the bank transfers the risk to non-banking finance companies. However, what has recently happened is that non-banking finance companies themselves have taken a large amount of loans which have turned non-performing assets. And because of this, the non-banking finance companies themselves have not been able to pay back the money to banks. And therefore, the loans that have been lent by the banks to the NBFCs have become non-performing assets, which was the same case which happened during the ILFS crisis, whereby the banks which had lent money to the non-banking finance company ILFS turned non-performing assets. And this happened because ILFS had lent money to the private sector which became non-performing assets and because of which it was not able to pay back the bank and so the loans which the bank have lent to ILFS also became non-performing asset. And because of this, there has been a decline in credit from both the banking and the non-banking finance sector. And therefore, the, one of the major concerns with regards to declining credit is that there has been a decrease in private investment. And this is because individuals and businesses are not able to take loans from banks and non-banking finance companies. And therefore, they are not able to borrow money to set up factories. And this has led to a decline in private investment within the manufacturing sector in India. And so therefore, it is within that regard that the author has given various solutions. Wherein the first solution given by the author is for the recapitalization of public sector banks. Whereby what the author is recommending is that the government should inject money to the public sector banks so that they are able to lend more money. However, the main concern with regards to this is where does the government get this money for the recapitalization of public sector banks. The second solution given by the author is again to provide more capital to those banks which are outside the PCA network or outside the prompt corrective action of the RBI. Now most of the banks which are under the prompt corrective action of the Reserve Bank of India are public sector banks and therefore when the author means to provide capital to banks which are outside the PCA network it can also be included to mean provide capital to private sector banks. Since the private sector banks in India have a lower non-performing asset ratio as compared to the public sector banks and these are the two main solutions which have been given by the author whereby pumping more money to public sector banks whereby if public sector banks have more money to lend then they can provide more credit to private companies and therefore the private companies can undertake private investment and therefore the growth rate in the industrial and the manufacturing sector would improve. Now based on this explanation, a question for your practice is which of the following reduces the ability of banks to lend credit. Now what you need to do is pause this video, solve this question and wait for 5 seconds for the correct answer. Wherein the correct answer to this question is A, 1 and 2. Whereby banks if they are put under the prompt corrective action or their provisioning requirement has increased, then it reduces their ability to lend credit. However, if the banks have been recapitalized, it is one of the steps through which 
bank can lend more money? And therefore, the correct answer to this question would be A, 1 and 2. So now hopefully you've also understood the concerns and the solutions given by the author with regards to the banking system. Now let us understand about the third and the fourth concern which the author has given together. One being employment growth and the second being current account deficit. Now there are five main concerns which the author has highlighted with regards to employment growth. When the first concern highlighted by the author is that there is unreliable employment data. Whereby what the author is saying that the employment data in the organized sector is still reliable but the employment data in the informal sector is not satisfactory and therefore we have unreliable employment data. The second concern raised by the author is of jobless growth. Now the author is highlighted that India is still growing around 7% however there has been no corresponding growth in employment and there are two main reasons as to why the author thinks this is happening. Whether according to the author, employment growth can occur either as a result in increase in investment or because of better utilization of existing capacity. However, with regards to increase in investment, what is being seen in India is that there has been a decline in private investment. And with regards to better utilization of existing capacity, it only leads to a marginal increase in employment. So now let's say if there are 100 people which join the workforce every year, only 50 new jobs are being created every year and therefore there is a requirement for an increase in private investment so that the number of new jobs which are created in India also increases. And the second aspect to this is that let's say a company is already employing 10 people. So if one person leaves then this company employs another person. However this does not cause any increase in the employment growth and what is required is for this company to further expand whereby year-on-year -year basis it may increase its employment number so that if this year it is employing 10 people then in 2020 it should employ 12 and in 2021 it should be employing 14 people. However what the author is highlighting is that both of these aspects are not working and this has led to a jobless growth within India. The third concern raised by the author with regards to employment growth is that there has been low investment in labor intensive sectors. Now one of the most labor intensive sector in India is the construction sector. However as you already might be aware that several of the construction companies have become non-performing assets and therefore because of this low investment in the construction sector fewer people are being employed in one of the most labor intensive sectors within India. The fourth point highlighted by the author is of the slowdown in the IT and the financial services sector. Now what the author is highlighting is that between 2004 to 2010 there was rapid growth in employment because of the information technology or the IT and the financial services sector. But what has happened now is that both of these sectors have slowed down and therefore what is happening is that the educated people such as engineers, management graduates and other individuals who used to be employed in the IT and the financial services sector have not been able to find opportunities within the both of these sector. And it is within that continued format that there has been a slowdown in the export sector of India also, wherein because of the ongoing trade war and the increased competition from several other countries of Asia, Africa, there has been a slowdown in the export sector of India, wherein one of the major export sector of India is the textile sector, which is also a labor intensive sector. However, because of the competition from Bangladesh, Vietnam and several African countries, the textile sector in India has not grown at the same growth rate in which it has grown in the last decade. Whereby the textile sector has not been able to give as many opportunity of employment as it had been able to do so in the past decade. So now hopefully you've understood the five concerns which have been raised by the author with regards to employment growth. Now there are two main solutions which have been given by the author with regards to employment growth. But in the first solution by the author is to increase the private investment. Whereby we have already understood is that by solving the banking crisis, it can lead to an increase in private investment. And by increasing private investment, it could lead to employment growth. Whereby the author has said that the revival of the banking system, even from the point of view of employment, is the key factor for the pickup of investment. And therefore an improvement in the banking system is required to improve private investment and thereby improve employment growth. Now the second solution highlighted by the author is for government intervention for the export sector. Whereas you already understand that government runs several export promotion schemes 
when one of the export promotion scheme is the merchandise export incentive scheme when apart from this the government of india also runs several other export promotion scheme so now hopefully you've also understood the two main solutions given by the author with regards to employment growth now let us understand the fourth problem which the author highlights with regards to the current account deficit now current account deficit in the simplest of terms means when a country's total imports are greater than the country's total exports where by the author has raised concerns first is with regards to the depreciation of the rupee due to the increase in crude oil prices and secondly due to the capital outflows that have been happening from india now as you already understand that the rupee has depreciated from rupees 60 to rupees 70 within the past year as compared to the dollar wherein 1 dollar is now worth around rupees 70 while a year ago it was worth around rupees 60 and what this does is increase the current account deficit for india whereby to import oil and other commodities india has to pay back in dollars but because the rupee has depreciated india would require more rupee so as to buy more dollars and therefore it increases the total amount that india spends on its import and since the total imports would increase it would increase india's current account deficit how you also have to understand that because of the rupee depreciation the exporters in india would also be earning more whereby an exporter used to earn rupees 60 when it used to sell a product for 1 dollar how would that same exporter would now be earning rupees 70 for selling a product on 1 dollar and therefore this also increased the total export value of india but you need to understand that india's import is more than its export whereby gold and oil are one of the largest commodities that india is importing and especially because of oil whose prices have risen in the past one year the total import bill for india has increased drastically and thereby has increased india's current account deficit the second concern raised by the author is with regards to foreign portfolio investment when what used to happen is that investors from the united states europe and several other countries used to invest in india because they would get a higher return on their investment however what is happening now is that the economies of the united states and several european countries have started to improve and therefore these investors from the united states and europe who used to invest in india have now shifted their investment to the us and the european markets and therefore this has caused an outflow of foreign portfolio investments from india since they are getting a better return in the us and the european market and apart from this this has also led to a decline in foreign direct investment since they shifted their investment to the us and the european markets now these were the two main concerns highlighted by the author with regards to the current account deficit now there are two main solutions which have been given by the author the first is to increase exports which is required to keep the current account deficit at a manageable level and the second solution given by the author is to contain imports whereby according to the author india needs to decrease some of the large imports so as to reduce india's current account deficit how will you need to understand that the author has not highlighted on how the exports can be increased and how the imports can be contained so now hopefully you understood the concerns and the solutions given by the author with regards to the current account deficit now let us move on to the fifth and the last concern that has been highlighted by the author with regards to agrarian distress now the first thing that you need to understand from this is what is agrarian distress and how is it different from rural distress Now when we say agrarian distress it means the weak economic conditions of those with livelihood in the agriculture sector while when we say rural distress it means those who have a weak economic conditions which have livelihood in rural areas now you have to understand that livelihood within rural areas includes agriculture dairy farming poultry farming craftsmanship and other forms of livelihood that may be present in rural areas while agrarian distress specifically deals with the livelihood of those who are engaged in agriculture and therefore this is a common difference between agrarian distress and rural distress and if a question is asked in the mains examination with regards to agrarian distress or with regards to rural distress keep in mind that both of these are different and you should not only focus upon farmer distress when talking about rural distress however the author in this article particularly deals with agrarian distress Now the first concern with regards to agrarian distress that the author has highlighted is low prices which are given to producers or the low prices of agriculture products which are then given to farmers wherein the author has highlighted that the fall in prices of agriculture product 
to flex an increase in output. And apart from this, low prices of agriculture products greatly benefits the consumers. And what the government is generally trying to do is ensure that the prices of vegetables, especially onion and several other essential agriculture products is kept low for the consumers. However, what both of these aspects do, irrespective of the fact that they both benefit the government and the consumers, they cause low prices for the producers, meaning the farmers. And these low prices to the farmers becomes one of the major reasons for agrarian distress, whereby it causes weak economic conditions of those who have livelihood within the field of agriculture, especially farmers. The second main concern with regards to agrarian distress, which has been highlighted by the author, is of weak government procurement, wherein as you already understand that the government pays a minimum support price for particular agriculture products. However, what is happening is that this MSP is not enough to ensure a proper livelihood of the farmers. And apart from this, the government is not able to procure enough of the supply of essential products that are given to the market so as to decrease the oversupply. And apart from this, the government does not have enough physical storage areas so as to reduce the oversupply of particular agriculture products which causes low prices for producers. The third concern raised by the author is that various short-term solutions such as loan waivers are being implemented by the government and therefore it does not address the fundamental problem with regards to agrarian distress which is to increase the productivity and enable farmers to achieve increased output and better prices whereby loan waiver does not help with the increase in productivity or neither does it enable farmers to increase their output and achieve better prices. Now with regards to these concerns the author has provided three solutions. Now the first solution provided by the author is that the government should intervene so as to reduce the oversupply of agriculture products wherein what the government can do is store these products during phases of overproduction and then release the products when the supply chain becomes normal and therefore what this would do is not decrease the prices of these agriculture products for farmers due to oversupply. The second main solution given by the author is of land consolidation wherein the farmers have to think in terms of consolidation of land holdings whereby this can increase the productivity of that farm and also improve the income for those farmers. And the third and the final solution given by the author is of value added production wherein farmers should also produce various higher value added products such as vegetables wherein if a farmer is producing wheat then it could also ensure that there are small patches of vegetables, fruits and other aspects which provide a better return in the market and thereby this can increase the total income of the farmer. Now you have to understand that the concerns and the solutions given by the author is with regards to agrarian distress when the author has talked about livelihood of those who have engaged in agriculture. However, when we talk about rural distress, one of the solutions which is given to reduce the farmer's distress is that farmers can also engage in poultry farming, dairy farming and other aspects of livelihood that occur in rural areas. However, since the author has only focused upon agrarian distress, the solutions have also fo only focused upon agriculture. So now hopefully with this, we have discussed the concerns and the solutions of all the five concerns which have been highlighted by the author C. Rangarajan sir, which are extremely relevant for you to understand, especially with regards to your civil services examination. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken the first article from page one and the second article is an editorial on page eight. Now what both of these articles talk about is China's spacecraft called Change 4. Now you have to understand that for simplification within this explanation, the pronunciation of this space probe of China would be referred to as Change 4. And what we do with regards to this article is understand the important aspects of Change 4 from the perspective of your upcoming prelims examination of 2019. But before understanding that, we'll try to first understand on how questions have been asked in the previous prelims examination on space technology. Now, if you take a look at the prelims examination paper of 2017, wherein a question was asked as to what is the purpose of the evolved laser inferometer space antenna or ELISA, wherein the correct answer to this question would be B to detect gravitational waves, wherein ELISA is a proposed mission of the European Space Agency and it is within that context that the purpose of the Kepler Space Telescope becomes relevant for your prelims examination. Now after this, if you take a look at the prelims examination paper of 2016, a question was asked as to what is Greece Lightning 10 or GL10 
which was recently in the news, wherein the correct answer to this question would be A, an electric plane tested by NASA. Apart from this, the question was asked on AstroSat, an astronomical observatory which was launched by India, wherein the correct answer to this question is D, neither one nor two. And apart from this, a question was asked with regards to the Mangalyaan which was launched by ISRO, wherein the correct answer to this question is C, one and three, wherein India is not the second country to have a spacecraft orbit the Mars after USA, wherein India is the fourth country after the United States, Soviet Union and the European Space Agency. So now hopefully you've gotten a context as to how questions are asked in the prelims examination with regards to space technology. Now what has happened is that China has become the first country ever to send a rover which has soft landed on the far side of the lunar surface. Now this rover has landed in the Ven Praman crater which is located on the far side of the moon. Now the second aspect that you need to understand about this is the significance of this China's probe. When the first purpose of this mission is that it would study the radio environment on the far side of the moon and thereby lay the groundwork for the creation of future radio astronomy telescopes that can be placed on the far side of the moon. And what is generally happening is that it is the near face of the moon which always faces the earth. And because of this, the far side of the moon is shielded from the radio knives of earth. Whereby let's say if this is earth, then the near face of the moon continues to face us. And so when we send a radio signal, it always sees the near side of the moon. And because we only see the near face of the moon, the radio signals which are sent from earth are not able to reach the far side of the moon. The second aspect of this mission is that it will study the respiration of seeds and photosynthesis on the moon. The third aspect of this mission is that it will pave the way for the country to deliver samples of moon rock and soil to earth whereby China is also going to launch Change 5 and Change 6 spacecrafts to the moon. And therefore this mission of Change 4 will allow China to make sure that the upcoming space missions of Change 5 and Change 6 would be able to deliver the samples of moon rock and soil back to the earth. And the fourth and the last purpose of Change 4 is that the lander will characterize the region's geology and the composition of rock and soil. Now the last aspect that you need to understand is why does only one side of the moon faces earth. Now this is because of a phenomena called tidal locking, whereby it is a situation when an object's orbital period matches its rotational period. And an example of this is our own moon, whereby the moon takes 28 days to go around the earth and also takes 28 days to rotate once around its axis. And what this does is that it results in the same face of the moon always facing earth. Now these are the main aspects that you need to remember for your upcoming prelims examination of 2019 with regards to change 4. Now question for your practice is consider the following statements and as you already understand, pause this video, solve this question and wait for 5 seconds for the correct answer. Now the correct answer to this question is B2 only, whereby China is the first country to soft land on the far side of the moon. However, China is the third country overall to soft land on the moon itself, whereby the countries which have landed on the moon are the United States, the Soviet Union, the third being China, and India based on this Chandrayaan 2 project is ensuring that India would become the fourth country in the world to achieve soft landing on the moon. However, as of now, there have been only three countries in the world which have softly landed on the moon, and China is the only country in the world to have soft landed on the far side of the moon. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now as we have already discussed some of the articles in depth that were taken in daily news headlines, now let us understand some of the other articles in brief which were also taken in daily news headlines or DNH. Now the first news that has also been taken in daily news headlines is with regards to Trump's statement on India's cooperation within Afghanistan. Now what Donald Trump has said that India has only built a library in Afghanistan and is currently not undergoing effective capacity building within Afghanistan as compared to the United States. Now some of the major Indian projects within Afghanistan is the construction of the Afghan parliament within Kabul, the construction of the Surbaito hydroelectric power plant, the construction of the Shatut dam, the construction of the Salma dam in the Harat province, the construction of the Dalram Zaranj highway which connects the major highway of Afghanistan with the Chabahar port, 
Apart from this, India is also forming an optical fiber network within the major cities of Afghanistan. And apart from that, India has engaged in over 100 high impact projects across Afghanistan, such as the construction of libraries, construction of schools, construction of colleges, training of police officers, training of Afghan's cricket team, apart from various other high impact projects which India has undertaken. And based on that, India has spent over $2 billion in development projects within Afghanistan, whereby India's development aid within Afghanistan is one of the largest among the Asian countries. Apart from this, one aspect which has also been highlighted that India has said that it does not send soldiers abroad except for UN-supported peacekeeping operations. Now, one of the demands of the United States is that India should send its soldiers to Afghanistan. And based on this, India has always said that India only sends soldiers for UN-supported peacekeeping operations. However, you need to understand that this news is not that relevant with regards to your UPSC examination. Wherein the most that you can do is remember the major projects that India has undertaken in Afghanistan and remember them for your prelims examination of 2019. Wherein if it is asked as to where does the Dalram Zaranj Highway or the Shatu Dam or Salma Dam or the Surbai 2 electric power plant are located, then you should know that they are located within the country of Afghanistan. And so thereby moving onward, we have already discussed in depth with regards to the Chinese space probe called Change 4. And so thereby moving onward. Now one of the other news that has been taken in daily news headlines is with regards to Supreme Court reviews the suit against Nestle. However, the only aspect that you need to remember from this is that under the Consumer Protection Act of 1986, it allows both the center and the state or either a person in their individual capacity or any representative on the interest of the consumer to file a complaint in the consumer forum. And therefore what you need to understand from this is that it is not only for the victim who can file a complaint in the consumer forum, whereby the state government, the central government or any representative on behalf of this victim can file a complaint in the consumer forum under the Consumer Protection Act of 1986. And this was the only aspect that you needed to remember from this article. And so they were moving onward. The second article we'll look at is from page 7, whereby RERA will be toothless without judicial powers. Now what is happening is that the several real estate regulatory authorities want the government of India to increase their power. However, to empower RERA with these powers, the RERA Act would need to be amended. However, what you need to know is that this news is currently in transition. Wherein let us wait and see as to whether the government of India moves forward with the demand of the real estate regulatory authorities to increase their power. Now another news that has also been taken from page 7 is with regards to the Kadaknath chicken. Now we are not going to discuss the aspects of the Kadaknath chicken and what you can do is try to answer this question and the correct answer to this question would be given in the end section of this video. And so now moving onward, from the editorial page on page 8, we have already discussed in depth the hope with concerns in 2019 or the issues that have been highlighted by C. Rangarajan sir. Now the second editorial which has been taken from the editorial page is with regards to the Sabri Mala judgment, whereby what has recently happened is that two women have entered into the Sabri Mala temple based on the order of the Supreme Court. However, the editorial in itself is not required to be understood and what you need to know is about the Sabri Mala judgment itself. Now the Sabri Mala judgment has been covered in depth by Mangal sir in the Daily News Simplified video of 29th of September. And what I'll do is provide you the link to this video in the description section given below. And so thereby moving onward. Now the next news that has been taken in Daily News headlines is from page 11. Whereby the law ministry has said that there is no proposal to increase the retirement age of Supreme Court judges or those of High Court judges. Whereby a parliamentary standing committee has recommended to increase the retirement age of judges within the Supreme Court and the High Court. Now the only aspect that you need to understand from this article is that it is under Article 2017 of the Constitution of India which provides the maximum age for a judge which is 62 years and it is also under Article 224 whereby no person appointed as an additional or acting judge of a High Court shall hold office after attaining the age of 62 years. Whereby if the law ministry was to accept the recommendation of this parliamentary standing committee to change the retirement age of judges, then Article 217 and Article 224 would need to be amended. 
Howard, the law ministry has said that there is no proposal as of now, and so thereby moving onward. Now the last news from analysis for today is from page 13. With regards to FDI rules for e-commerce have not allowed foreign direct investment in inventory-based model or multi-brand retailing. Now what you need to understand from this is what is an inventory model, whereby the main feature of an inventory model is that customers buy the product from the e-commerce firm itself, whereby this e-commerce firm manages the inventory, the interfaces with the customer, also runs the logistics and involves itself with every aspect of the business. And an example of the inventory model of e-commerce is Alibaba from China. And this inventory model is different from a marketplace model of e-commerce, where the main feature of the marketplace model is that e-commerce firms like Flipkart, Snapdeal, Amazon provide a platform for customers to interact with a selected number of sellers, whereby an individual like you and me is purchasing a product from Flipkart, but he is actually buying it from a registered seller on Flipkart itself whereby this product is not directly being sold by Flipkart and it is just a website platform where a consumer meets a seller. And therefore it is within that aspect that the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion has said is that FDI has not been allowed in the inventory based model and FDI has only been allowed in India in the marketplace model. However, if you need to understand further about the e-commerce policy of India, what you can do is watch the Daily News Simplified video of 3rd of August whose link is provided in the description section given below. And so now with this, we have discussed most of the articles that have appeared in the daily news headlines and thereby have provided a comprehensive coverage of today's newspaper. And now with this, we come to an end in the analysis of today's newspaper. Now we move on to the question for today.